the Daily Talk Show, episode 635. Dave Lee's in the building. Dave Lee down under. Hey boys, how you going? Mate, welcome. Thanks uh, for having me on. So you uh, and Josh went to we VC? did v- Yeah, we did a VCA course like together. like a summer thing, yeah. wasn't it? It was I, like a teen flicks, uh-huh. that was this something w- like that. This was not where the guy who the murderer... No, that no, was another, another one. Oh, no. Okay, I was gonna say. no, I went to... When I went to VCA, I did the foundations course and yeah. then a guy turned out to be a murderer. He oh, went, really? Yeah, yeah. I was, was hoping, I was hoping to leave nice. it with no context. <laughs> 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 no, but I was... Yeah, I thought you might have experienced this guy. No, too. unfortunately not. No, you got out. No, you got out. You got out. Mate, I love your hoodie. Thanks it's so a, much. It's yeah. a uh, Bugs, Bunny. Bugs Bunny all over. Yeah, mate. It's, we I look had, like had shit. To wrap it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I want to. Come on. I want to start wearing this shit. Where did you get it from? Uh, HMV, not HMV. Bloody, I always say it. H and M. I always say HMV. I've got my head in the DVDs all the time. H and M in Melbourne or overseas? overseas? Yeah. I just spent a bit of time in England and picked it up over there. Yeah. Thought, well, Josh has showed me your YouTube channel, yeah. and it's. It's fucking bespoke, isn't it? <laughs> it's real. I love it. Thank you very much. You, I mean, now I've met somebody who actually has, still has DVDs. Yes. And many you, of them. You, and you actually make money from it now. Well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the best possible way. Tell us about your channel. Well, my channel is uh, it's called Dave Lee Down Under, YouTube, obviously. Um, and I like to say I talk about movies, pop culture, animation as kind of my, uh, my niche, I suppose. And I cover everything from, as you said, Blu-ray hauls, talking about Blu-rays, DVDs and stuff like that, um, right up to documentaries, editorial videos, covering the latest movies and also um, covering films of the past and animated classics is kind of my little niche, I suppose. So as as the channel started to grow, I've started to realise it's, it's all about celebrating the past of cinema, celebrating mm-hmm. the future of cinema and also trying to you know, keep people interested in collecting the physical stuff because I think there's a very, um, it's still a very important market to mm. have everything, you know, physically and in hand as well, well as embracing the new. I feel like uh, there's a bunch of people that haven't been able to ride out that period of time where DVDs were just the nuisance, probably mm-hmm. like a doorstop mm. to the yeah. point where it's f- far enough on that they're collectibles. Yeah. Whereas you and your old man, Rick, who's here too, hey, Rick, mm-hmm. you've, um, You've you've rode that wave, but you've also invested in that wave. Yeah. How many DVDs do you have? Uh, we've got a collection or- which has uh, just surpassed something like five thousand three hundred or something. Jeez. Which is movies, TV shows, mm. the whole shebang. I mean, do you ever need to? Because I know you've moved on to Blu-ray, and I think yeah. Um, yeah. every time you mention DVD, yeah, is yeah. that a, is that an insult? If I say <laughs> yeah, DVD? it was a little. Um, <laughs> well, because I never bought a Blu-ray player. Like I never. I was. Do you have a PlayStation? Because yeah. PlayStation was Blu-ray. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, did you ever yeah. do HD DVD? Never did that. We no. kind of, I think, when it made that transition to the mm-hmm. HD, we just waited it out because it was this whole like format war. Mm-hmm. Hey, is it going to be HD DVD going to prevail or Blu-ray? Mm-hmm. So we waited. You know, we just we just waited out, see which one. Because I know so many people now who invested in HD DVD, and it's just dead hey, format. Yeah, Nothing yeah. plays it. So My we man. waited, luckily, and went with Blu-ray when that kind of took off. You reckon there's a VCD guy? <laughs> <laughs> VCDs, no, like, VCDs no, didn't serve. That was like the, uh, the, uh, the illegal part, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was a yeah. very fine line. Yeah. Bootlegs, yeah. Um, you had a rebrand. Yes. So Josh you, loves a good rebrand. I love a good I rebrand. Have a rebrand. Did uh, Bugs Bunny, is that part of the rebrand? Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and so you went for so you used to be Disney. Disney Dave Down Under and for so, about a year and a half. And so did what was the decision to, to rebrand? Well, I had started... A lawsuit? <laughs> well, well, that was actually part of the thought because actually Disney do were starting to clamp down on websites using their name. So mm-hmm. I know there were a lot of channels around the time starting to rebrand, getting the like all these Disney fan channels. That wasn't the main reason, but that was kind of at the back of my head thinking well, I should try and jump out before they, you know, jump on me. But yeah. uh, the main thing was really... I tried to find success, I suppose, in the YouTube space or even just in the film space for a, for a few years prior to starting my channel. I, pre- I did have a previous channel to this one where I was doing movie reviews, not very well. I had maybe 30 subscribers or something over a couple of years. And the initial impetus behind this channel was I'm going to start fresh and I'm a huge Disney fan, as you know if you've seen any of my videos, and I've got a huge collection of Disney stuff, whether that's Blu-rays and books and collectibles and all that. I thought, well, I've got all this shit here. 
I may as well make a channel that's focused around all this Disney stuff because I'll be able to pump out, you know, constant content based on it and use that as a jumping point to try and get where I want to get, which is talking about movies in general. So um, I guess, yeah, I sort of was a bit sneaky about it and tried to build my base around the Disney stuff. Mm. And then when, it, when I felt it was time to grow and people were actually saying, oh, I'd like to hear you talk about non-Disney stuff or talk about, you know, I'd like to hear you review a non-Disney movie because people were starting to say, well, we, we like the way you review films or the way you talk about films. I'd like to hear your, your thoughts mm. on other stuff. And I thought, oh, it's bloody time to drop mm. Disney Dave down under and change to Dave Lee down under. And it seems like it's quite bulletproof until you moved to the UK. Well, and yeah. then <laughs> and then you're Dave Lee down da- under. Well, I had that. I had a lot of people saying you're going to change your name to <laughs> Dave Lee up over or you know something like that. And I I I, I did. Oh, I didn't really consider it seriously, but it was a thought where I was like, well, what can I do with it? How can I do it? I ended up staying over there for so long that I'm just happy I didn't yeah, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. Uh, while I was over there, my channel grew something like, uh, was it for, uh, 400% growth I had last year? That's great. On my channel. So if I'd changed to Dave Lee up over, mm. it would have been, I would have been <laughs> right there still. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, I like the, I mean, look at like Thunder Down Under there, a male, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. male troop, male dance group. That mm-hmm. I'm present, in Vegas. They live, yeah. yeah. And but I think heaps of people take the branding of Australia mm-hmm. overseas yeah. and yeah. keep it in the name. I like, like Bondi yeah. Sands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> over, over in the, yeah, US. And, yeah. um, Getting to that many subscribe, how many subscribers have you got right now? Uh, just past fifty three and a half yesterday. I That's think. amazing. Thousand. Uh, and so what's <laughs> fifty three and a half <laughs> from, from, from thirty to fifty? Worst, <laughs> your worst <laughs> guess. That would be the best. Right yeah, the bottom yeah, of the barrel. Um, now we support it, everybody. Now, and everybody. so how do you yeah. how do you get to to that sort of growth? Are there any secrets that you've identified? It's about being persistent and being reg- persistence, regularity. Um, Staying topical. Mm-hmm. Essentially, they've been the three key things for me along the way is just making sure you are pumping out stuff on a constant basis, whether mm-hmm. that's every day or every week or every month. You know, get something up there and start. You know, you have to have this regular sort of routine where people are coming back and they know to, to expect that you've actually got this, you know, routine. Otherwise, that turns people off. They say, oh, this guy's uploaded one video in the last two months. Mm-hmm. So people don't follow that. And then uh, just being topical and producing content on stuff that people are searching for mm. as opposed to content people might just stumble across. Sure. So if a new movie comes out, I've, I've been very lucky to get on a lot of media lists uh, to be able to attend a lot of preview screenings, like early preview screenings for the new release films. Um, so I might get to see them sometimes the night before, sometimes a few days before, and it's about just getting a video up as soon as possible. And so, for example, uh, Avengers Infinity War, I got to see that essentially two days before it opened in the US. Um, So there was no embargo. So I was allowed to publish essentially whatever I wanted to as soon as I got home and got home at probably 10 p.m. after the film and just punched out a bunch of content. And it was like I did the film review and then I did like an editorial video which was explaining the post credit scene because I know a lot of people like to come on and some of the people who, you know, aren't diehards, aren't diehard fanatics of the films or the comics or whatever want to know what was that little teaser at the end? And they go to YouTube and someone's explaining it. So I thought, I'll mm. do one of them. That was my first video that took off a million subscri- uh, a million views on, the on, post. That, on that post-credit scene explained yeah. video. Do you get Avengers that, Josh? Infinity War. Yeah, so that's like... So only because if you don't go to the cinemas, yeah. you wouldn't yeah, I, know. I went to drive-in. I went yeah, to Dramana. But, on but the, no, 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 I think even if you weekend. go and you don't know what happens, you wouldn't hang yeah, around. Sure. Like the credits roll yeah. and then five minutes later, no, I'm good like a new that scene singer. comes... Well, because I feel like doing film and TV stuff, you sort uh, of yeah. enjoy yeah. the credit. Like the credits are, yeah. you want to give you know the crew a bit of mm-hmm. bit of time and, mm-hmm. and to read it. Exactly so right. I have I have seen it. What was the specific one on? What did they do for the? It was it te- it was a teaser for Captain Marvel. So it was oh, yeah. um, Nick Fury and Maria Hill get out of the car after the whole snaps happened and everyone's you know turned to dust. And they get out of the car and his pager starts flashing, and the Captain Marvel logo flashes up on his pager and it's essentially like a six minute video of me explaining this, it's, this is Captain Marvel's <laughs> logo on the screen. This is who Captain Marvel is. This is how it ties into the next film. 
and that was a million hits because I was the first one to, to get oh, that so video up that's because right. I saw it two days earlier in the US and I was up till 5 a.m. doing the video. <laughs> so it's about just being persistent and just trying to just cut cut in ahead of everyone else. And do you monetize a video like that or are you using yeah. copyright content? Well, the, the good thing is in, in this space, um, there are these laws called fair use laws, which means you can lit I can literally use any visual I want as, well, as long as I'm using it for um, educational purposes, commentary or criticism. Mm -hmm. So I can use any clip from any TV show or any movie or whatever and basically get away with it. Uh, of course, the studios do try to demonetize your videos or try to copyright claim your videos and stuff, but I've been very lucky to be able to just write on these fair use laws and they usually, once you um, contest it, they usually drop it. There's a, there's a few studios who are very heavy-handed with it and won't drop it, but most of them have been really good and, I've, yeah, can just monetize that. What's been your most controversial piece of content that you've, you've ever done? Oh, I don't know. Don't know Anything that's like uh, you've oh, had an opinion you know about a film or Star something? Star Wars and stuff. Star Wars stuff. <laughs> and it's got to the point where I've just stopped talking about Star Wars. <laughs> Hang on, just, we had John Safran on this show right, yeah. and he was saying how he went down a rabbit hole mm -hmm. of people that were like channels dedicated to talking yeah. about what was going to be coming out. The Star, This yeah. was before it was released mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how bad it's going to be. This is why. Mm -hmm. And they said the full break. It wasn't your channel, was no, it? No, no, no. Okay, good. I'm <laughs> very pro Star Wars. I've loved Star Wars my whole life. Okay, Star yeah, Wars yeah, is yeah, like, the, like the, one of the very first movies I saw that yeah. got me very invested in wanting to make films and, you know, talk about films and stuff. So I've been very like pro Star Wars this whole time and I've had this, you know, I've, I've, I've supported the films and I've had some issues with some of the newer films, but overall I've, I've loved them all. Um, and having an opinion that you like a movie on the internet is uh, very controversial to some people. <laughs> Especially <laughs> that film because everyone... The oh, yeah, The Last Jedi in particular. I got trolled for months and months. I still get, I still get <laughs> comments on old videos, like two-year-old videos of people... Call me a dickhead and oh you fucking <laughs> suck, you idiot, you know, whatever. Death um, threats, any death, death threats. Death threats, yes, yeah. a lot of death threats. What? And it's like May I the can, force be with you. Like is it you legit get, or how do you decide? Like, well, you just don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of trolls out there, a lot of very mean spirited mm -hmm. people who take their movies so passionately that it just becomes like something <laughs> something else. And I, I get in a lot of trouble because I I can't hold myself back from trolling these people back <laughs> and I just, I can't bite my tongue. And I've, I've, it's got to the point where I've said, you know, I've got to step back from reading the comments and stuff because they suck me in every time. I have fun with it though. Yeah. I, I play around with them. I probably should not because then I'll get myself in trouble. But yeah, the Star Wars stuff, man, this, some of the stuff I've, I've had on those videos is nuts. And I've just stopped talking about Star Wars. It's mm. not fun. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty thick skinned so I can, I can deal with it. Mm. And if I, if I couldn't, I wouldn't be doing it. But it's got to the point where I'm just like, oh, it's just so draining. I just don't want to talk about Star Wars anymore. Well, just I think you're deep within a subculture. That, oh, yeah. That is, what is the thing that people outside of the subculture, what would they be most surprised at? It could be, I mean, Star Wars is, is yeah. its own subculture. It's mm -hmm. its own bloody ecosystem. I think it's just how passionate the fans are and how heated the fans can get. And whether it's from the pro side or the against side, there are some very, very passionate people passionate people and they, again, they take to extremes what from, about, from both sides. What about like outside of Star Wars into, I don't know, some Disney stuff? Is there any sort of weird stuff that's going on that we don't know of? <sighs> like within the Blu-ray, like f owning physical copies, like is that a scene? Well, I think there's a very small niche of people on YouTube that do it, that mm -hmm. do Blu-ray hauls and stuff. Uh, to various levels of success, I suppose. Halls. Um, so this is a YouTube terminology because yeah, I've watched so I, halls I explain, and a bunch yeah. of other stuff. What do you, how do you best explain? Essentially just buying a bunch of shit and showing it off and going, look what I've hauled up. It's the anti-minimalism. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Do you know <laughs> what you're getting or is it a haul that you're buying, like a whole stack that you like? Um, it's usually like I'll go to say JB Hi-Fi has a sale, like they do a 20 or 30% off sale and occasionally they'll have like – most of the time they have like a multi-buy thing where you buy two Blu-rays for 20 bucks and then they'll have a 20% off sale. So you get the 20% off the mm -hmm. two for 20. So you're essentially getting discs for like five or six dollars. Yeah. And you just go when they have a big sale and just haul up, buy a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and it. then I yeah. asked Josh's dad is a hot rod head or a car yeah. Uh, yeah. motor head. Mm -hmm. I asked him how much he'd spent over his lifetime on cars and he said, what, nearly a million? Yeah, I think over the years. Yeah, yeah. Over yeah. the years. Cars are more expensive. What about you? What's the price tag I've, you've got? 
I have, I don't know. That's I what could, Josh's dad said. <laughs> Throw I a number at it is what wait. I said. It's like but there have been a few times where we've gone, oh, geez, how much have we spent on this? And it's like, it's, it's not worth thinking about it. Just don't <laughs> think about it. Just don't think well, about it. Well, if we go, says what's 5,000 times by, say, five, if you're doing five yeah. bucks a day. So a quarter of a million? Is that what that is? Average about that, maybe that 25,000. 25, 25 grand. But no, I, I mean, think it'd be what, more. Average, 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 maybe yeah, 15, eight, 20 bucks? Eight, yeah, maybe 10 bucks. 10 bucks? Go in the okay. mid. Go in the but mid. But then there. also if you're doing collective, like collector's items and stuff. Like um, you're paying more for one. Yeah, I mean, how often are you actually only spending five bucks on a Blu-ray? Um, not too often. <laughs> I mean, it's usually it's usually around maybe like eight dollars is probably like is like a good price for something. Mm-hmm. If you get something for five bucks, it's like well, that's pretty bloody good. Okay, so yeah. well, so average. What do you work out, Mace? I mean, if it's ten about bucks, fifty maths, grand. I was, I was yeah, off yeah. by ten bucks is fifty grand on DVD on Blu-ray or mm-hmm. DVDs. Yeah, which wow. I mean, for your passion. Yeah, I mean, and you. Right. But what came first? Was it the, I mean, you've had your YouTube channel for a while. You've had yeah. two. What came first? Passion for the thing, like actually yeah. getting this stuff and being really into it. Yeah, it's, well, my whole life I've been interested in films and for as long as I can remember. I mean, my, my grandmother, my dad's mother, had a huge collection of VHS when I was a kid. And it was it's always go, going there. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. so. I think it is just being a hoarder. On 23 really. and me, would um, it come up you know, in the DNA? <laughs> and so and like, she, would, she would literally go and buy VHS and not watch them and she would just buy them for the family. So it was like a little lending library. People would go over, mm. borrow a VHS and watch it, it's return it. Like a blockbuster. It. She had like, well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> she had like a little book where she'd mark off all the stuff that she'd had and who borrowed it and whatever. And I probably just spitballed from there, I suppose. Mm. And then when... DVDs came out is when we started really heavily collecting movies and stuff. It's just spitballed over the years. Yeah. Did you ever, um, like it was shops closing down, so mm-hmm. like a blockbuster or things like that, have you ever taken advantage of it over these weird sort of situations? No, not really. Mm. Well, we tend to buy brand new. It's very rare that I'll buy something that's like secondhand. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing I think can think of is maybe like Easy DVD when they closed down years ago. They were like the first big I store to sell Blu-rays before JB kind of cottoned onto that market and I guess drove them out of business. I think they're, they're an online store now, but they used to have a lot of stores physically. And when they closed, they got rid of a bunch of stuff really cheap and a bunch of merchandise and like all these little exclusive things that they were giving away with DVDs and posters and stuff. And we'd go in there and just have like a little bucket of stuff you could go and grab for free. It's like, yeah, grab all this stuff. All these posters, like hundreds of posters, I reckon. And they're just sitting up in my cupboard doing nothing. Yeah, I remember like, um, did you go to movie shops like Blockbuster and Video Easy when yeah, you were yeah. a kid? Yeah, when, when I was a kid, we'd go to Blockbuster and uh, hire the five five that you got for a week. Yeah, uh, like yeah, the, the yeah. old older films that you get for a week. That's really where my, um, I guess my uh, my knowledge of cinema came from. Just bar- borrowing older old stuff, stuff from from the video store, and then you get the two um, overnighters. Yeah. So you watch the two new releases and then return the next day. So we did that all the time for for many years when I was a kid until we actually started, you know, buying the stuff. What about like uh, remember the movie like cutouts that you could yeah you'd see names on them like they've reserved them. Do you remember that? Like there was posters yeah. and you could reserve a poster yeah. and there was like a, you could buy them. What a weird time. Yeah. What, so, what's I mean, your so preferred um, thing to eat while you're watching a movie? <laughs> oh, just anything. Anything. I like food, chips. Yeah. Uh, we got a popcorn machine at home. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we drove down to Dandenong. There's a place. It's actually the place that supplies the theatres. Really? The popcorn machines. And, what's the cost um, of a popcorn? I'd love a popcorn machine here. How much was a popcorn machine? Oh, yeah. not that expensive. Probably, I don't know. Four hundred bucks or something. Oh, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. It wasn't. You, well, it wasn't expensive at all. Yeah, and so I guess you have to add the butter. You get that. You get <laughs> everything from there. Fully supplied. You get the kernels. You get the butter. You get the salt. You get all different flavors of salt. You get like cheese. Like, this stuff as weird as cheese. Yeah, yeah. It's called, and it's called, super, it's called super pop. Super pop. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what it's called. Super I think pop. so. In Dandenong <laughs> South, I think. Dandenong, how yeah, good yeah. would it be? Like if you came in to the studio and there was like popcorn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the annoying thing about it is the audio <laughs> yeah. capture. If you could well, hear people. You'd, you'd, pop, yeah. you'd pre-pop. No, you'd pre-pop it, but then people even eating it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's a bit of a pain in the but, ass to clean. But too. say if we had like um, more seats for people to watch the show. Mm. That'd be great if you had a the bleachers. What do you We'd blow out though. Yeah, I'd probably eat too much. But I'm, I'm <laughs> popcorn. I, I don't like it. It's, I think it's overrated. 
I, th- I would I mean, definitely I eat it. it, if it was yeah, exactly. no, I, it's one of the things I, I eat. It's Friday. actually genius. I was at the movies and I was like eating popcorn. I say I don't like it, but I still fucking eat it. Yeah. And I'm just like, why? And M&M's to it. Why am I eating this? Yeah. I'm just going to continue eating. Yeah. It's the most genius thing because you can eat it for two hours straight mm-hmm. and you don't get full. Mm-hmm. It's just like constantly eating. So it's, it's a genius thing for film yeah. and being at the film. What's who, the, who the came different up models? with popcorn at, at films? Like, no idea. And who can Yeah. Who sure worked out yeah, like uh, yeah, I, like even popped? It's just like an corn. old carnival thing, isn't it? I suppose it probably yeah. goes back to mm. then. It's like, like that that old like carnival film. Yeah. You Pop- go see a go and see an old film, and they sell popcorn at the concession stand. Oh man, it's I guess so that's the expensive. Cheap thing, probably at, now at it's cinemas, then, it's really expensive. Oh, yeah. But I guess the thing is, Tommy's got a spa. Have you fixed it by the yeah, way? Yeah, uh, drained half of it, filled it back up. How did water you drain was, it? No, I just used a bucket. Oh, oh that's mate, it took, me, took me five minutes to get half of the water out with a bucket. Okay. You don't yeah. want to try the siphon. I didn't have a pipe. Okay. Like a, a tube. Yeah, and so enough. the thing is with these things like spas, it's one thing to um to own a spa, it's another thing to use it. Yeah. Are you using your popcorn machine? I can't remember the last time we fired it up to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. The first, I reckon the first maybe six months we had it was like, oh, it's that popcorn we watch the movie. Yeah. People come over, oh make popcorn and stuff. It's a pain in the ass to clean the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you just don't spa clean it. This is exactly the spa. Just it's take out all the machine, the put spa in. Yeah. It's always the cleaning, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. So it, we've got a fondue set at home. Oh, how many? How many other people? <laughs> yeah, like it's just ninety percent of landfills made up of fondue machines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's outrageous. What about your 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 collection? Like, how, I'd love to see some kind of stat page. It's almost like the weekly stat, Dave's stats. Yeah. How many movies you've watched this week? How many vids you pumped out? How many how many hours of video m- movies are you watching a week, do you reckon? At the moment, I'm getting up quite early in the morning and I'm watching a movie every morning. Oh, because shit. I've, I, because, like I said, I've realised how many movies uh, before, sorry, before we started the, came on the show, we were t- talking about how many movies I've just, mm. I've not watched that are in mm. the collection, which is almost a couple of hundred, mm-hmm. if not almost a thousand. And it's at the point where it's like I just got to start actually finding time to watch these, and I find it a good way to get the creative brain waves flowing too in the morning. Try and watch something and just start thinking creatively as soon as you get up. So in the morning I watch a movie. And, in bed. Um, or on no, the I get up. I force myself to get up. Well, you've got like a cinema room. Yeah, we've got a cinema room. So, got, <laughs> <laughs> so you can either watch three it in bed or you could and, yeah watch it in the cinema room. So I get yeah. up and watch a movie in the cinema and. So, yeah. <laughs> and then what is this before? Do, do you work during the day? Um, yeah, I work on the channel. I'm basically so it's full-time, full-time you're a full-time moment, YouTuber? Pretty much. Fuck yeah, how good is that? And so I mean, this is just, I mean, that's just awesome that you get to watch a movie every day. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit different if you're doing it before going off to your day job. Yeah. It seems more indulgent, I think. Well, this I, is work for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, I, try and, I try and force myself up about 6 o'clock, 6.30, and get up, watch a movie, and be working by 9.00. Yeah. So I'm trying to just at least get into that that kind of routine where I am working like normal person hours mm-hmm. and just, you know, keeping myself going really instead of just watching movies all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the hardest part about what you do? Just the um, – well, the, the videos that I'm really, I guess, more well-known for now, which is the stuff that's really helped the channel take off, is these documentary videos I've been making about uh, cartoon characters. I call it my Cartoon Evolution series – I might focus on, say, Bugs Bunny, and I, it's about a 20 to 30-minute video talking about the history of the character and um, where, how they've, you know, gone over the years, how they've evolved over the years, over 70, 80 years, uh, nearly 100 years, some of these characters. Uh, these take me probably two weeks to make full-time, and the hardest bit is just doing the research and just writing it and just getting the motivation to edit the thing mm-hmm. because it's like... Just full on, just really, uh, it stresses me out a lot of the time. Like I've got a pretty good knowledge of the the animation, um, you know, classic animation and the classic studios and characters of the 40s through to the 60s, what we call the golden age of animation. And um, most of my knowledge is is, is Disney. Mm-hmm. So from the Disney studio is where most of my passion has been. And it's only recently that I've really started diving into like the Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry from MGM and all these other kind of studios. And it's almost like every time I jump into a new character that's from a different studio that I'm not as familiar with, it can be a bit more stressful to just do the research. It's almost like starting over again. But the good thing is Walt Disney was such a pioneer of the art form 
that everyone just followed him. Mm -hmm. So if you're reading about Bugs Bunny and there's something happening at Warner Brothers in like 1942 and you go, hang on, the Disney studio did that a year before, you start piecing the, you know, the puzzle pieces together and realising that everything that I know about the Disney studio really forms this backbone of everything that I'm doing for all the other characters in the studio. So it makes it a little easier. But, yeah, it's just that whole process of researching, writing and very time consuming and very stressful sometimes. Is that uh, Walt Disney frozen? Did he freeze himself? That is the rumor. I thought you, I thought you no. meant the, the animation. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Walt Disney <laughs> froze himself yeah, in the future the if there's some way of bringing you back to life. Yeah, what's it? Do you... He was cremated. So okay. he's cremated so he's, and he's, he's in a. And then frozen? That seems backwards. He was very, he was a. Is um, he frozen maybe? No, there's a, there's a rumor that he froze himself. Mm -hmm. Um, because he was an innovator first and foremost, you know, and he not only innovated films, but he wanted to innovate technology and just mm. was looking into all this future technology around the time that he sort of passed away in the 1960s and the 50s. He was very interested in, like, modernism and he essentially wanted to build a city. So what we know as Walt Disney World, which is the theme park in Florida, essentially started as a prototype community of tomorrow, he was calling it. And he, after the success of Disneyland, he wanted to build a, a community mm. and he wanted to actually build a city where he could experiment with future technologies away from film stuff. He was just completely, you know, interested in all this future technology. And there are correspondence between him and a cryogenics lab that date back from around the time around around near when he passed away mm. and he was showing interest in cryogenics and freezing after death and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but he never went through with it. That's the official story that he never went through with it. But, uh, mm. but yeah, apparently he was cremated and he's in a, in a wall in a cemetery. How cool would it be though if that was really the case? Oh, yeah. It's like I, I called cool. it. Well, some people think he's buried under Disneyland, frozen and under Disneyland, under the castle. That's the rumour. It'd just be too, <laughs> too much logistics. Yeah. You know, he's going to stay frozen. Yeah. He'd really make sure. That's the exciting story. So I burst the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, there's enough money in, the, oh, yeah. in Disney. Who oh, owns yeah. Disney now? Is it still the original it's, people? No, it's, uh, it's privately owned now. Oh, sorry, it's not privately owned anymore. It's like a, what do you call it? It's, it's not in the hands of the Disney company anymore. Mm -hmm. Who bought Def Jam Records recently? So there, it's know. um. Can you look it up, Sevs? Someone, Nickelodeon? No. Anyway, I own a um. A Universal. Univer Universal Music Group. D bought Def Jam. Parent organization. Yeah. Now nah, there's a there's another Furby. The people that make Furby. I don't know. Look up. There's more there's obscure so many connections, purchase. right? Well, it was a yeah. random business buying into mm -hmm. like something. Oh, look cool. at GE or whatever, like all the shit that they GE money, yeah, like that. Well, no, GE, like the big General Electric or whatever, oh, they yeah, were yeah, into yeah. like NBC, like yeah. media stuff. And there was a yeah. whole thing around in like the late shows where they'd be like, I oh, put a tote, like people who were mm. used to selling toasters were all of a sudden in charge yeah. of content. Yeah, look it up, Furby. Who owns Furby? Uh, Death Row Records. Death Row is owned sorry. by Hasbro, Hasbro. which is the Toy. That's a weird yeah. purchase. They're buying yeah. like, um, you know, two pack. Mm -hmm. I think was with Death Row. Maybe. Um, I own a. Uh, it's like an animation slide of yeah. Disney of uh, Bugs Bunny, yeah. and so it's like wow. drawn, um, signed by Hanna Barbera. My yeah. um, dad's best friend has a a shot a gallery called Silver K Gallery, right? Yep. In Armadale. You know, you've been yeah, there. Yeah. And so, like, he's. I mean, he's run that thing for. Years, I don't oh, remember yeah, going there as a kid. He's in like an ad. He's, he had his own ad. <laughs> TV <laughs> commercials. Yeah, he's fine. We're going to have him on the show. Oh, we got it. He's a character. He's a legend. But I remember he would bring out all these people that, you know, the, I mm -hmm. think there's a photo of me with Hannah Barbera years when I was yeah. a little baby, like a little, a little, yeah. like a toddler. Um, had, do you own any paintings, any are you collecting no, any of that stuff? Because that's any. its own world that he has, which yeah. is art collection of animation. No, of I film. don't really have any cells or anything. I'd love to, but mm. that's just another. Would well, you want to buy thing. mine? That's what I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you uh, met the voice of Bart Simpson. Oh yeah, when I was very young. <laughs> was that one of the first sort of celebs? I think it was. I think it was one of the. It was probably the first like big like international celebrity that I that I'd met. Was the voice of Bart Simpson? She came out. Nancy Cartwright. That's right. A woman. Yeah. Yeah. Because Bart's a little boy. She came out and uh, did like a it was like a one woman 
sort of show thing where she just mm-hmm. talked about the Simpsons, did the voice and stuff, and did a signing at the end of it. So that was, and I'm, there's a photo of me where I'm wearing my bloody Bart Simpson Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, uh, I don't know how old I would have been, maybe 12 years old at yeah. the time. Yeah. It's so cool. Like my, cool. My, I've got a three-year-old and he's into, if I showed him right now a picture of Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, Wonder, like he, not Wonder Woman, what's the um, Captain, Marvel. Captain Marvel? He knows yeah. all of them by name. That's that. That's like cool. it's. I don't even know know them. And he I've hasn't got seen huge, no like Spider Man. Like I haven't even shown him mm-hmm. the movie. It's like all in the book. Yeah. And he's already onto it. Like yeah. that. They, they, what they've. It's, it's so addictive what they've created. Oh yeah. Well, there's you find these picture books for children for like an M rated film. Like <laughs> some of these Marvel films, you see like the junior novelization of Captain America: Civil War. You think. Yeah, that's what we got. It's like, yeah. it's like, oh, there's Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> he knows all the names. Yeah. It feels like um, fast food places don't do as many sort of franchise stuff like yeah. they used to. Well, like the connections between. Oh, yeah, like, it's like Batman. The I feel like, yeah, you'd always yeah. get like the plastic cup, I things think, like that. I think there was a. I think it was to try and stop the kids from wanting the junk food. Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure that was behind it. I know in the 90s, Disney had like a huge um, like – sponsorship deal with McDonald's, mm-hmm. which is why it was constantly like Disney figurines yeah. and stuff. But I think the reason why McDonald's even, I think I think why they've got rid of like Ronald McDonald and all the like uh, Grimace and oh, the yeah. bird and all that was because it was just too enticing for children. That's why I understand anyway. Well, it's like I remember like the Pez dispenser, yeah. like with um, like I feel like Bugs Bunny was, yeah. was on one. Yeah. That's ridiculous. I mean, this is just advertising now. Like you, you take the kid to the supermarket where the um, – where the yogurts are mm-hmm. and the ones that they point to oh, yeah. are the branded ones that yeah. are the worst for you. Well, you've got oranges, like bags. of. There was a thing like a few years ago where there was just a bag of oranges with a Frozen sticker on it. It was like <laughs> Olaf, the little snowman from Frozen, just stuck on the oh, back of it. That's a good one. It wasn't even like a printed packet or anything. It's just yeah. a little Olaf sticker. Uh, let's and the trick these little to... bastards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, what's your, your favourite Blu-ray that you own? It doesn't have to be your favourite oh. movie, but like... It could have sentimental value or it's a great story. Worth that the you, most. Yeah. I don't know. I've got a lot of like um, Warner Brothers did these when I guess when Blu-ray was at its peak. Mm-hmm. They did these huge what they called ultimate collector's editions or these big box sets and they came with like oh, memorabilia yeah. and, and like a book. Some of them had like a full um, screenplay, like the printed script and just all this random stuff, that like five or six discs and I just I, I cherish those things because they're just incredible. And a lot of them are out of print now and – with a lot of money. And so how here. much, I mean, is there d- certain ones out there that are worth more than others, like a yeah, individual I'll, Blu-ray? I'll, well, people pay crazy money for movies that are out of print. Okay. So essentially that means like if the studio just stops or the distributor just stops releasing that film. Oh, so what was one recently that it was pretty well known that they'd stopped stopping printing any of them? Well, it was recently, within the last year, well, they've Disney was it. Well, Disney, Disney used to have all the. They used to have like the the rule around oh, DVDs. The, the vault. The yeah. Disney had the what was called the vault system, which was that went back to when they were releasing the films theatrically. They would re-release the movies every seven years to theaters to mm. get more money on a film that was like 20, 30, 40 years old. And once they went into the home media market that system just continued where each movie would be released every seven years. They do a very limited batch mm-hmm. run of the film. You might be able to get it for a couple of months sometimes. In the later years it was like you could get it for a year or two and then went out of print. Um, and then essentially when it goes out of print, you can't get your hands on the movie for five or six years so that once that movie's back out again, people who have been trying to get this movie for five years just go and buy, like, pay full price for it. Just like, mm, I've been trying to get yeah. my hand out for five years. Like Snow White and the yeah. Seven Dwarfs. We oh, got yeah. that. Like as a kid, I remember it being like a big deal yeah. of like, oh, this is, this is an investment, yeah. you know. <laughs> so Where now, is it now? <laughs> so know. now they've done this whole <laughs> Disney Plus thing. The mm-hmm. sis, the, that vault thing's just like gone. <laughs> like you just get on there and play whatever you want, yeah, whatever you want. I'm surprised Walt hasn't woken up. Well, <laughs> just yeah. fucking and frozen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just thought himself out. <laughs> yeah. But they did because they purchased 20th Century Fox not mm-hmm. uh, like a couple of years ago. And I, there was a story where they have stopped releasing a lot of the Fox films on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. So a lot, of the, uh, the, a lot of the Fox films that are on physical media, they're just stopping the print runs of them and essentially vaulting them. And so you have insurance on your DVD, on your Blu-ray yeah. collection. Yeah. And can you insure the ones that 
are, were, are technically worth mon- more money on eBay or a something. Collector item. Yeah, can you? Probably. Well, yeah, we, we'll probably class that as a collectible, mm-hmm. but not really. I mean, try and prove to someone that you've got a, a Blu-ray that's probably worth, you know, someone might pay 200 bucks yeah. for on eBay. Mm-hmm. Who insures this kind of stuff? House and contents? It's just house and yeah. contents, basically. And, and you insure it, you insure just a monetary value. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you put a monetary value on it. And that's part of the reason you'll have a you'll have a if you really need to catalogue everything. So if you catalogue everything, um, and for argument's sake, your house burns down or somebody comes through and you know takes everything out of your property, you've at least got a catalogue of everything you had, mm-hmm. and you can say to them, "Well, this is what we had, and this is the monetary value we put on it." They will essentially just pay you out that monetary value, um, and it's any insurance company. So whoever you insure with, RACV or mm-hmm. CGU or Amy or whoever it is, yeah. um, will insure it all. Um, insurance, with insurance, it's uh, things like jewellery that if you need to, you can't really sort of put a monetary value on it unless you have it valued mm-hmm. and yeah, you've got yeah. a certificate to prove it. But with things like DVDs, you just do, you just insure, insure a monetary value. Yeah, sure. So you'll do an average, you know, if you've got 5000 you put an average of $10, $10 with well, this $50,000 worth, mm-hmm. and that's the value you put on it. Yeah, sure. So you might insure your contents of your house for $400,000. Mm-hmm. 50000 of that will be... Yeah, that makes sense. Will be DVD, and then they just look at Dave's channel and say, "Yeah, no, he's <laughs> legit." Nah, it was. Yeah. Well, you could just catalog, like, like, just check out the whole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you see them all there. Um, in terms of making money on YouTube, what was the first moment that you made cash out of YouTube? Probably only in the last year or so. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was probably only making seven hundred dollars a month up until maybe twelve, you know, eighteen months ago. Um, more on was, the doll. You get more <laughs> doing, much, doing yeah. the doll. Um, and it's really this, again, this cartoon evolution series they've been doing about these cartoon characters people love. I mean, most of them have minimum 100,000 views on them, which is, and it's the first, like, consistently successful series that I've actually done. So a lot of the times in the past you do a video and it does really well and you're like, oh, I'll follow that up with another one, it just tanks. But this is the first series that's, like, consistently, consistently getting the same views per mm. video. Um the video I did on Bugs Bunny is the one that's maybe the most money mm. because just that's that's eight hundred and fifty thousand views or something now. So that will probably top top a million views over the next I think month or so because that's still that video's nearly a year old now and it's still getting sixty thousand views a month, which just boggles me. What about so, affiliate stuff? Like obviously, if you're encouraging people to yeah. buy stuff. Does Australia have a market for that? Can you, does JB and those types um, of stores? I get I get a lot of affiliate stuff through Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my uh, subscriber base is something like sixty percent American viewers, right. um, and every time I do a Blu-ray view, I do a series of videos which is like Blu-ray, uh, like announced and detailed video. I call it. So say. Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker is coming out on Blu-ray. I'll do a video which essentially shows you all the versions you can get, breaks down all the special features and stuff on it, the packaging, all the special edition versions that are coming out, retail exclusives, whatever. And I'll post a link to the Amazon uh, page and people will click through that and buy the movie. And it's really small, like less than 5% commission that you get off that. But it does build up and you get a lot of people buy. I'm, there was a Batman animated series box set and I sold something like 50 units of it. Yeah, great. And you get like the, the commission off the back of that. So I do get a lot of commission as well. I've done a few little sponsorships in the past too, which gets you a little bit of money here and there as well. So there's all these little avenues where you can, you know, monetize. And, mm. yeah. Well, it's, it, it's an interesting, I mean, it's, a, it's such a hard one because you you, your goal is to create relevant content that people even watch. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to go the other way of like, oh, I'm going to make content to make money. Yeah. So you'd like, oh, yeah. well, you, you have to get step one nailed before yeah, you can it. even think well, about Well, money two. just never really came into it until, again, like a year ago. It was always just something that I just had fun doing and it was maybe a way to get my foot in the door, to get recognised maybe somehow. And then once it started taking off a little bit more, it became a little bit more serious for me and I started looking into all these ways where well, you can actually monetize it and actually make you know, a decent living off it in, in the long run. How much thought has to then go, say you, someone's making $0 and they're yeah. doing it because they love it, 
and then they work out, oh, I can make a little bit more now. It's starting to work. Mm-hmm. How much of your time then gets spent thinking about how to make money out of the channel, how to be smarter about it? Um, so I think now that I'm taking it more seriously, I do have to dive into like the analytics and all the charts and all. YouTube is very good now. Is uh, We get what's called a creator studio, which is really in-depth breakdowns of how many people are watching it, how much money you're making on each video, how much money you're making each week, how much you're making each month, how well videos are performing, how long people are watching them for, how many people... Uh, the videos are being advertised to and how many of those people are clicking onto the video. So it's like really, really in-depth stuff. Mm. So it's now for me really about going into that, analyzing it in depth, figuring out what works and what doesn't and trying to get rid of all the stuff that doesn't work and focus on the stuff that does work because that's the stuff that equals growth and then eventually hopefully equals, you know, monetary growth as well as... You know, subscribe. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. The important thing is that when you go into these things, you don't go yeah. into it to make money. You, mm-hmm. If you go into it thinking, I'm going to make a lot of money out of this, it'll never work yeah. for mm-hmm. two reasons. One, you don't have the passion to do it and you'll burn yourself out really yeah. quickly. Uh, now, Dave will work 12, 14, 16 hours a day nearly every day. And I'm talking weekends as well. So if you don't have the passion for it to do it, you can't do it. It's only when yeah. you get a bit of a sus- subscriber base that you can actually start thinking, okay, well, if I do it this way, maybe I can sort of start making money out of it and make a living out of it. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much yeah. what you've got to do. You Don't ever go into it thinking you're going to make money out of yeah. it because it just won't happen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah we can definitely test that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly <laughs> right, exactly. Well, I've always been curious about podcasting. How does that work, monetization and yeah. everything with podcasts? Well, for us, like, yeah, exactly what you said, Rick. It's like we've started off like we use the video production business yeah as a way of funding it. We know that after, if you create great content mm. uh, over time, then you'll build something yeah. that's worth something. But I think that, yeah, there is there is that sort of um, thought that you need to be making or you should be making money from yeah. day one. No. And and I think that's really happens. hard. I've been doing it four years now. My mm-hmm. channel's been going, I think, really like full-time-ish three years. Um and as I said, it's only now that I'm really I'm, – I'm not making a huge wage. Like mm-hmm. it's not like a perfect wage. There's like a huge way to go. Um, but it's comfortable at the moment mm-hmm. um, for what I need and just yeah, just to be comfortable. Um, so it's, it's not that that's like the, – that's not the number one thing. You do mm-hmm. have to grow that, that base and think long run, hopefully how can this become something a bit more, something that's mm. a profession. And not a lot of people are able to reach that, you know, yeah. that end goal. Uh, we are talking about Amazon before. Is it true that you contacted Amazon and said, I want one DVD or Blu-ray in a whole collection and did they separate out something so you could get, get no. one of them? That didn't happen? No. I feel like I heard a, heard a story around what, getting one specific, like out of a series. You're like, I, I've got this whole series. He's mm. nodding his head. Yeah, it was um, one of those ABC cartoons you used to watch. Remember that you that they you, you couldn't get the last season of it. Oh yeah, um, there were, that's right. It was the distributor who mm-hmm. did uh, Rocco's Modern Life. Oh yeah, classic, right? <laughs> the classic Nickelodeon series, mm-hmm. and um, they did they released each season separately, mm-hmm. and except for the last season. And I was like buying these things from day one that they were releasing them individually. I was like, I'll buy that, I'll buy the Rugrats, I'll buy Real Monsters and like all, all the Nickelodeon series I was buying. Mm-hmm. And then for some reason, the only way you could get um, Rocco's Modern Life season four, the final season, was in this box set. So I was I was hounding the distributor mm-hmm. for months like, are you going to release this last season? What's going on? I want to buy the season. Oh, sorry, you have to buy the box set. I'm like, I don't want to buy the box set. Because I've already bought all the other ones. To do, like, why do they do that? I, probably how well the, the mm-hmm. discs sell. It might be that they've looked at the figures and gone, these seasons haven't sold well, just bundle them up in a box set and make that the only way you can get season four. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's smart from a business point of view, but then the people who have been collecting that series for maybe a year get shafted. Uh-huh. So I I just kept hammering mm-hmm. them. I, like, just, I was like, just sell me season four, please. And after a while, they're like, "All right, we'll sell you the last season." They're like, "Give us, send twenty bucks, and we'll send it out." And they finally did. That's great. After just hammering them for months. That's yeah. a win. And Lucky so, you, Rixie, because you yeah, forgot that. I mate. Just went blank. Yeah. Uh, and so, you just gave, like, you just transferred cash to them. Basically. I think it was like it was either like a PayPal thing, uh-huh. or they gave me like the 
um, you know, bank details or whatever. I just gave him 20 bucks. I was like, here you go. I don't care. We'll pay on it. I'm not buying the whole box set all over again, though. And uh, Mr. 97 is part of uh, what he calls the Life Hack Club, right. which he's the president of. Yeah. And he likes to get deals. He goes on Oz Bargain a bit, yeah. things like that. You seem to be like a bit of a deals guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you have any good deals? deals? With Davey's other yeah. channel. <laughs> yeah. Can you give us a deal? So there's the JB Hi-Fi one. Yeah. When when do the JB Hi-Fi deals happen? When do like are there certain times that we should be keeping an eye out? It's it's so often now. Mm -hmm. It's so often. Like every few weeks they'll do a twenty percent off. Well, they're doing thirty percent off now. It used to be twenty percent off. It's now thirty percent. We not of them. buy on twenty percent. Like is twenty percent trash now compared to thirty? Well, like, if they do a twenty yeah. percent, that's something that I want for the sake of you know spend yeah. an extra fifty cents. I'll okay. I'll, I'll go twenty percent. Sure. But um, they do what's uh, buy one get one free every May. I think every May they do buy. Okay. It. So literally every Blu-ray in the store, you buy one, you get one free, and um, they jack the prices up. Everything goes back up to regular retail price. But if you're smart about it, you can get some good deals. So essentially what you do, if you buy just a whole bunch of stuff and you take it up to the counter, they'll scan it all in and what happens is you get the cheaper stuff free. So sure. what I try yeah. to do is I go, here's a $20 one, here's a $20 one, match them together, here's a $40 one, here's a $40 one, match them together, mm -hmm. $5 one, $5 one, match them together, go up to the counter and you go, I want to put this through like three, four, five different transactions. Yeah, great. <laughs> so that you maximise how much you save and otherwise you're only going to save like 20 bucks. Do you, st like, do people know you from JB now? Yeah, here's, like, a fucking, you, here's the guy in the bloody <laughs> sweater he's again. He's YouTuber. Um, I yeah, think Bugs maybe, Bunny's maybe once one of the guys there was, was like, oh, yeah, you're in here a lot. Um, <laughs> one of the store managers was getting a bit annoyed that it was filming stuff in there. Oh, really? Um, yeah, That's it was, weird. What, mate, like they... I think it's just more about like people in the store and not getting in the way of people. And uh -huh. like he was cool in the end. We just explained yeah, it. Three like, point lighting yeah. and four cameras. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I had to get I had to get permission actually from PR mm. to actually go into stores and film and stuff. And PR were cool with it, but then it comes down to the the store, store manager manage, sometimes yeah. might not be on board with that. That's completely fine. Like fine. Like I get that. Um, and he was cool in the end. But um, yeah, you do run into little problems. I don't do so many of the going into stores and filming mm. anymore because there's a bit of a a bit of a hassle to try and My yeah. favourite's the when you go to the the locker to oh, yeah. to collect stuff. You don't yeah. know which yeah. which locker is going to open. Yeah. Have you used this before? What's that? The parcel lockers. Oh, I was post parcel oh, lockers. Oh yeah, I've seen those. It like Mac at Seven Eleven. Yeah. Well, so you Both dial it in, and then it will go. Choo. Yeah. It depending if it's a big or small, it will just go into the random locker. Yeah. That's so cool. It's essentially you just. If you buy something online, you go you you set up a parcel locker address with Oz Post, and if you buy something online, you just give them the parcel locker address, and they just send all your stuff to the parcel locker. In fact, you got to go there after this and pick something up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got to pick up. Um, and yeah, so you just go there, you get the Oz Post app, it gives you a barcode, you go up to the machine, you scan it, boop, and one of the things just opens up, you get your stuff. That's yeah, what a weird easy. weird world. Uh, Rick, <laughs> what did you do? Um, what do you do for a job? Um, I'm a commercial photographer, so I, I um, essentially advertising photographer. So you you get the sort of world. Oh, exactly right. Plays yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and that's 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 part of the reason he's able to do it mm -hmm. is because I have an understanding of of how hard it can be to actually do what you want to do. Although I was really lucky, I I caught a couple of breaks really early in my early twenties, and and I never really looked for work. I've never looked for work in my life. Um, so I have an understanding with a lot of the freelancers that, I, that I've that i worked with over the years that the struggle and the support they need around them to be able to do what they do. So my view is that what Dave, what Dave is doing is essentially building a business. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as you guys know, trying to build a business takes years. So you've got to have a bit of support around you to help you do that. Mm. And... Um, you know, I've just been lucky that I've never really had to look for work. Yeah. Um, and now I've 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 sort of stepped back from it a bit now, and and I'm sort of semi-retired and just do a little bit here and there. And what do you think about you know, I've got a three-year-old son, loves TV, loves watching movies. You know, it's a weird one because you you're like trying to restrict their view time. You know, because you want them to do something outdoors and be a bit social, whereas. The opposite is it's now your job. Mm. It's it, it's worth doing every day. Yeah. It's worth putting into the routine a movie every day. Yeah. 
Whereas there's, if my son always, said that to me, I'd tell him to get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> he there's wants always, a movie every day. There's always yeah. a balance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's always a balance. You you can't you can't sit in front of a TV all day. I mean, God, I'm, you know, how old I, how old I am? I could sit there and do it all day, but mm. but it's not healthy for you, mm. and it's not healthy for anybody. And and you find kids kids will will only take in as much as they as much as they can, and as much as they need. And usually that'll only be a couple of hours. Most kids don't have a, a huge attention span. So my my view has always been to um, allow Dave to do what he needs to do. And we've never really put restrictions on 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 what he does. He's the one that's got to live the life. He's got to make the decisions. Um, but with young, young young children, you guide them and help them, but... Essentially, they're going to grow up and be the person they're going to be. And there was that, that old, old, that old. I think it was an old BBC show, um, Seven Up, oh, yeah. which which was you know they 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 filmed a bunch of kids at the age of seven, and then every seven years they went back and filmed them right up till about the age of forty two or something. I think it was, or maybe even older. Um, and what they found is that the child at seven, you sh- the catch cry was, "You show me a child at seven, and I'll show you the adult." So essentially. Your whole persona is is um, ingrained in you by the time you're seven years old, and you don't change. Now I remember, I I sort of fell into photography, but um, I'd finished I'd finished high school and and was a bit lost and didn't know what I want to do. And one of my mates was going to photography college, and I and I um, I hadn't seen him for a couple of months, and I asked him what he was doing. He told me he said you should come and do it. So um, I thought, oh, yeah, geez, I remember wanting to do that all my life. And then I remembered that when I was seven or eight years old, all I wanted to do was take photos. So from that age, I always wanted to be a photographer. Although as I got older, I wanted to get into video and, and all that sort of stuff, but fell into photography mm. and just happened that I had a, you know, I had a, had a I suppose, an aptitude for it and I was able to adapt my well, my, my way of thinking was was suited suited photography perfectly, and I, and and you'll find that every child will be like that. They'll be, get to about the age of seven or eight, and that child will be what the adult will be. So you'll find that Dave Dave the first I think the first movie that Dave ever made, home movie he ever made, was he would only have been about five, six, seven years old around about that age, and he's wanted to do it his whole life. Do you think that there's a pressure? Like Dave picking this sort of career when you're finishing school, is there a pressure to uh, I've got to go to uni, I've got to do this, I've got to do that? Or even like I guess when you love films, there can be that sense of like I need to make films rather than being like oh, my real passion is talking about all that stuff. Well, my passion's always been wanting to make films Mm. and – um that was I, went, I studied. Uh, I went to film school for three years. Came out the back of that and found that the landscape of the film industry in in Australia had changed rapidly from what it was when I first started university. Um, when we went into university, they told us, you know, ninety percent of the people who do this course come out with a job, and at the end of that, half of those jobs didn't exist anymore. Mm. Um, so I had to then just kind of adapt. I took I took a gap year actually after after I finished uh, university. Which, which uni did you go to? Deakin, uh-huh. Deakin Uni in Burwood. Um, so they got a big studio there. Yeah, they had the big TV right. studio. We pro- we produced a, a series for Channel Thirty One there actually. Mm-hmm. So we spent two years doing that independently. It was like a late night talk show thing. It wasn't very good. Uh, but we did no, that it was for great. two seasons. It was with your mate, with my mate, yeah, yeah, Josh. Yeah, that's right. What was it called? The si- the Silicon Lee Silicon show. Lee show. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of fun and it taught me a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I found that doing university was was very helpful in, um, I mean, at the end of the day, a degree in, in a creative field isn't always going to get you into a creative job or career. That's people who are hiring for creative jobs are looking at your portfolio and looking how um, the, the kind of work that you can actually do and they tend to gravitate towards people who know how to do it themselves as opposed to people who have had it drilled into them through an institution because everyone comes out thinking the same. That's, um, that's really true with everything. I, mean, I know with, with photography, you can, have all, you can have all the qualifications in the world. It doesn't mean to say you can do the job. Yeah, yeah. You can show me the best folio in the world 
but it doesn't mean to say you can come in and do what we do mm. because, it, because you know, what you guys do and what Dave does and what I, what I do, it can be really high pressure. Mm. So you find that the, there's a lot of people that just cannot do it. And, mm. and I remember employing, employing uh, one, one particular guy who'd been doing it for 30 years and I thought, well, okay, we'll bring him in. He lasted a week. <laughs> he couldn't keep up the pace. Yeah. yeah. And it's so like um, s- skill specific as exactly well. Exactly right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Like you did a lot of like catalogs st- stuff. Yeah, and things catalog like- and magazines and yeah, and you had and-, and so you had to know like doing being able to shoot a product well is completely different than doing some like exactly artsy right, yeah. type yeah, of exactly stuff. Exactly right. right. Yeah, exactly. Like I was, I was a uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a. Well, I think I'm a pretty good um, technical photographer, mm. not so much a visual photographer because yeah. I'll work from a layout. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll get the creative and all that sort of stuff. And um, uh, from there, technically I'll take over. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, there's guys that will be visual photographers but they're not very good technically. Yeah. And that's true in all walks, walks mm. of life. You'll find, you'll find um, people out there that are lawyers that, that weren't particularly good students in, in law, but they're great lawyers. But you'll find the best students as lawyers aren't great lawyers. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's what I guess you know? university is hard too because it's yeah. like trying to fit people into these boxes. Yeah. I guess it's a good discovery mechanism. Well, for me it was really about just a learning experience mm-hmm. and whether that be um, like a, everything that I've everything I do, editing and writing and, and all that, I've taught myself from a very like, young age, just as you did. Mm-hmm. Um, but going to university, I think, really helped me hone into a few areas that maybe I'd not experienced with. I am I'll, The thing I think I learned the most out of university was writing, stuff about writing. And like I could be writing a script now and I still think back to some of these things that this, you know, the lecturer told me and like really hammered in. Um, so that was a real learning experience for me. But coming out the back of that and not really being able to get work in the film industry, it's then about, well, I still really want to do this. I still have a real passion for this. It's about adapting and finding new ways to do what you want to do. And at the end of the day, for me, it comes down to storytelling. Mm. And I'm, um, I think all I want to do really is tell stories in a visual medium. And whether that's whether I'm working on big films or on television or sitting at home and putting together a 20-minute documentary on Bugs Bunny – um, it's just telling stories. Yeah. And I want to tell stories to people, st- stories that entertain people mm. and that people can learn a little bit from and, you know, just finding a way to adapt to do what you want to do. And it also feels like you can actually, with the way that you do it, you can have impact so quickly. Yeah. So you work on a film and it's like you're mm-hmm. writing a script yeah. and you have to wait, you know, X amount of years before yeah. it to go out. Like there is something cool as well about uh, every single week Yep. You can be having impact yep. and learning. Yep. And it's instant. Like mm. you put a video up and you get comments instantly. And sometimes it's like five minutes after you've put a video up, you made a mistake here. And you're, <laughs> fuck, you know, I just spent two weeks doing this yeah. and someone's already picked up on this like minuscule mistake. But, a lot, but you know, 90% of the comments are like, oh, you know, really, really good uh, positive comments. And it, it is good, that instant gratification of it. And it keeps the drive. I mean, if I was spending two years on a Bugs Bunny documentary, I think I'd like it go crazy at the end of it if, you know, you just put two years into it and oh, you made a mistake here or yeah. whatever. Um, but, yeah, it, it, that instant gratification does keep you going and go, all right, I've just done this video. It's taken me two weeks' time. I'm going to take a couple of days off and yeah. I'm going to dive into the next character and do the next video. That's a niche uh, video that I've gone down a rabbit hole on is mo- uh, mistakes in movies. Yeah. Do you do those videos? Um, I think I've played around not so much mistakes in movies, but I have done like little analytical things like diving into the movies and looking at like little weird things and stuff. Some of them do well, some of them don't do well. And it's, yeah, it's just about kind of finding where your niche is and where your audience is going to gravitate towards. But there's so many like different kind of like Easter egg videos, people talking about like the little oh, yeah. like little hidden mm-hmm. things in movies and references and stuff like that and then just like analysing trailers and talking about like say the Avengers trailer comes out and you put together a video going, oh, this this could happen and this like, th- you know, like making up theories and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So there's all just very, very, very niche parts in this, I guess, YouTube movie space and some people really excel at it and some people try and do it and – not so great. A lot, like a lot of the stuff I've done has just flatlined. 
um, like tra- like reactions is a used to be a thing. Like people watching a movie trailer and filming themselves watch the movie trailer and react to it, and they used to be huge. People loved them. I had one which went like thirty, forty thousand views, which is one of my first like big videos that took <laughs> off. But now I struggle yeah, to get yeah. a thousand views. Well, I I remember watching you do them. Do you feel like you have? I f- I feel like it would be so much pressure to perform and yeah. react. It's oh, like, yeah. oh, wow. Oh, it's like, oh, it's oh, my, God, oh my God. God. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but in reality, if I'm sitting there watching it, I'm like, it's good. Yeah, 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 sort yeah. Of thing. So there is like a lot of it's hamming it up. And mm-hmm. even a lot of just even the way I present my videos and stuff is kind of, I guess, not so much putting on a persona because mm-hmm. I'm, you know, myself, you know, 100% of the time I want to be real and honest, but there is this other level where you do have to ham it up just mm-hmm. a little bit and just kind of make it just a little bit more exciting, a little bit more enticing. I think a lot of people like that who are in front of cameras, I'm sure you guys probably, yeah. you know, do it from time to time. It's just you got to mm. just bring in energy. little ways to bring out yeah. the energy uh, and get yeah. the audience invested. What's the um, the most anticipated film for 2020, do you think? I think this year is such a lacklustre year for films. Mm-hmm. I just there's not one movie that I'm like really hyped about. I mean, we've had Avengers Endgame last year, which was like the huge Marvel film, which I've been hyped for for like ten years. Mm-hmm. When's Captain America coming out? Um, well, we've got is there a new this one year, coming. This year we've got Black Widow, which is at the end of next month, and that's really the big Marvel movie for the year. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the actually there's the Captain, uh, sorry, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier mm. Captain America miniseries for Disney Plus at the end of the year. Oh, yeah. So that's I'm looking forward to that. Uh, um, the Matrix is when's that in a couple of years? A couple or? of years, yeah, yeah. They're doing another one of them, which would be interesting. Are you into all that stuff? Um, so? I've I've never been huge on the Matrix, but I How do like. How many times do you reckon you've watched it? The Matrix, maybe twice. Okay. Maybe two or three times. Mm-hmm. Not for many years. Yeah. Not a huge fan, but I've never seen it. So no, I need to embarrass probably. Yeah, it's God, good. Uh, do, where do you go to watch your movies? What's your cinema of choice if you actually go out? Usually, I like village cinemas. They've got Shopper. a big screen and well, yeah, just the shopping centre. I, I love, I love the Astor Theatre in Melbourne. Oh yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I haven't been there for a long time. Mm-hmm. Ever since they got bought out by Palace Cinemas, I think, mm-hmm. but they were run uh, independently for for a very long time and. A huge movie palace, like one of the last movie palaces left in Australia, especially in Melbourne, and they would screen. The, the guy who owned it had, a, had or has a huge collection of, of movies on film prints, like right. these old original film prints, and he would play it in this movie. Mm. Incredible. Like seeing like Apocalypse Now in the original 70 millimeter Technicolor print, incredible. Um, so I used to go there all the time, but they got mm. bought out, and a lot of the a lot of his prints got taken off him by the distributor uh, by the studios oh, really? at one point. Oh, rats. So a lot of it's like digital now, and I've just yeah. haven't been drawn back. There's, just, there's something about film. I was reading this morning Barney's Beanery in LA. Have you been to LA? Uh, yeah, I've been to LA. Um, it's just on Santa Monica Boulevard. Yeah. I think it's an old sort of pub dive bar, looks sports bar. It's amazing yeah. memorabilia on the wall. You can only have something like that if you have been open for a hundred years or whatever. <laughs> yeah. it is because it takes that much time. But I was reading about Quentin Tarantino sat up the back and wrote Pulp yeah. Fiction. But there's something about that that I was like, oh, fuck, yeah. I want to go back there and yeah. look at that corner. Yeah. It's weird. Like, I mean, what? because then I have all the feelings of what Pulp Fiction did yeah. for me when I watched mm-hmm. it, and it's like, this is the most amazing. Yeah. And then it's it's there's something so amazing about film. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, that just. Well, for me, it's been huge part of my life for as long as I can remember. And the same when I've, I've been to LA a couple of times, been to, to the US and finding the places where your movies were filmed or, uh, you know, like you said, someone sat in the back and write or somewhere where Walt Disney went and ate a chili once or something is like, oh, it's just, I just want to go there and get a picture. Um, when I was over in the UK, uh, we found a little street in Edinburgh in Scotland where they filmed parts of Avengers Infinity War, which is a movie that's like two or three years old. And even just being there is like so cool. And it yeah, just feels yeah. like, you know, you've got this picture in the place where the movie's been and just such a big part of, especially for me, big part of my life and just, you know, indulge myself in movies every day yeah. and finding, you know, places even like as far as going to the cemetery where Marilyn Monroe was, you know, buried or in, interred in the wall and just doing all these little things. I think it brings you closer to the experience. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. It is cool. Like there is something like calming about nostalgia as well oh yeah just sure. like i like that idea of just going like especially like this i like the 6 a.m thing i tried to when i got uh disney plus i was like yeah. oh i've got all the like the simpsons yeah 
and I st- I created a notebook, and then every single morning I was going to watch one episode yeah. and write a review. <laughs> I got three pages in. It's like quite the commit. Like yeah. it is a big commitment. So many episodes so, now, yeah. like 30 seasons or something. Yeah. yeah. yeah and the, and no YouTube channel. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I've got no <laughs> reason to tell. I was going to do a bit on the show about it. but Yeah. I'm sure people would love it. Yeah. 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 Just like your little 30-second Simpsons yeah. review every day. Did you see about the Simpsons um, Disney Plus getting criticised because of the 4 by 3 They crop the aspect, yeah. yeah. Have they fixed that? I don't. I don't think they have no. yet, but they said they were going uh-huh. to. Well, they sh- made it wide. No, so in or- stuff that was meant to be uh, sorry, the stuff that was meant to be four three was sca- like scanned in at sixteen yeah. nine, and so you're missing Sweet. jokes, visual gags. So like the first twenty seasons were four three was yeah, only yeah, after I season twenty they went to widescreen. Um, yeah, and they cut a lot of the visual gags off. Like there's this one gag that uh, was used. I saw it on Facebook. The the example someone made was um, Homer goes to the Duff Brewery to see how the Duff beer is made mm-hmm. and he comes up to like three or four large you know, vats of Duff beer, Duff light, Duff regular, Duff strong, whatever. And then along the roof is all these pipes and it's the same pipe that leads into every single <laughs> vat. So it's like every single one's the same. Yeah. And the Disney Plus version, it crops off that pipe from the top. So you just lose this joke. visual game. Yeah. And it's the same thing with like Channel 10. Channel 10 used to play The Simpsons and would cut to an ad break before the punchline of the joke <laughs> or they would fade out. It, yeah, all the time. And it would be like they would fade out on the punchline. I, I used to hate that. <laughs> so <laughs> annoying. Yeah. I mean, if you've got it, there's probably a little reason for you to watch free to air with what you have access to. Yeah, very like, little free to air. Do you ever like, is there something nostalgic about just being like, oh, I feel like, Watching the ads, or do you just always like you would have every Simpsons episode? Yeah, I've got all the Simpsons DVD. Yeah, yeah. So would you ever? Have you ever caught yourself watching Free to Air? Sometimes, if I'm not doing anything, or if I, or if I am like working or something, and I just want something on in the background, Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, Simpsons are on. I'll just put on put on this. (laughs) But it's so rare that you find like a classic episode Uh on. It's all like season 25 onwards, which is just stuff I'm not interested in. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, well, I'll catch myself just going, oh, this movie's on and I'll watch it even if it's got ad breaks or whatever, just in the background. And to a final question, cleaning Blu-rays and DVDs, yeah. do you have a strict sort of schedule around cleaning them? Not really. We've got them in big cabinets. Cabinets have got doors on them. Uh-huh. I'm very lucky that it doesn't get too dusty in there. The only things I really need to clean, and I don't do it as often as I should, is like my collectible like action figure thing. I thought you were going to say the barbecue. <laughs> yeah, I, well, no, I need to always clean the barbecue. Yeah. It's a nightmare. But yeah, that's about it. <laughs> DVDs, not so much. And you, not keep, so bad. you keep your um the pop things out of it. What are the, I what, take them out of the box, yeah. What's it called again? What are they called? Pop vinyls. Pop, yeah, the pop vinyls. Pop, pop vinyl, like Funko pop vinyl. And so things. you're not too extreme in regards to like keeping no, them? No, there's yeah. some stuff I'll keep in box, mm-hmm. like stuff that I know is going to be worth something or something that's like um I think it looks cool in the box. But most, most of like my pop vinyls and stuff, I take them out because otherwise you've got a whole shelf and it looks like you've walked mm. into like a EB store <laughs> with just all these pop vinyls. Yeah. But, and I've seen yeah, pictures yeah, of people yeah. who do it. It's yeah. like, nah, just they get them the out, put them on the shelves. The red sale signs and you've got yourself an EB game, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Pretty Thanks much. for coming on the show. No, yeah. 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 I feel like me. we should um, – I think that we could do specific episodes where you get, get you on about uh, like anniversaries. Like we yeah. need to dial in when things are – are happening for sure. I'd like love what, to. Well, like, um, <laughs> yeah. What have we got coming up? Are there any anniversaries coming up with, like, uh, for, like experts? Disney? When yeah. was the last time? When? Well, how old's Disney? Disney, oh, hundred, hundred, nearly hundred years. Mm. Yeah, that'd be a big one. Hundred yeah. mouse, just or even no like idea. just any like I know nothing about pop culture, yeah. movies, all that sort of thing. I feel like there's so much, mm. yeah, that we could could talk about. Yeah, dial um, it in. I'll yeah, do it. Great. Thank you. Love it. Uh, been great. It's a daily talk show. Remember. Uh, you can still become a VIP Gronk. Is that right, Sevs? Sure can. You've got till Friday. Mm-hmm. Go to thedailytalkshow.com forward slash Gronks and uh, fill in the form and you'll be uh, a VIP. And you get free stickers if you sign up yeah. by the 13th of March. Then uh, the stickers are 100 bucks each. <laughs> Uh, yeah, collectible inflation. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's uh, you got to <laughs> get in early. Yeah. You've never sold them, but if you want to buy them, you got to print. Got to exactly. get them. Happy. Yeah. It's a daily talk show. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me on. See you tomorrow.